Hi everyone, I'm Ryan Keith, and I'm your professor for general psychology. Earlier this week, I posted a discussion topic where I asked you to ask your own questions about conditioning and about learning, chapter five in the textbook. Every single semester, this is one of the hardest topics that my students try to tackle. And for me, conditioning was one of the hardest topics I had to deal with in my own psychology career. It uses terms that you're not familiar with, and in an even harder way, uses some terms you might be familiar with, but that you've used in entirely different ways. Now, you guys have done an excellent job asking questions and trying to answer them on the discussion forums, but I wanted to try to clarify, clarify things a little bit also. To do that, I'm making and posting a couple of brief videos where I try to answer some of the most common questions about conditioning. In this video, we're talking about classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is one of the first kinds of learning conditioning to be studied in a laboratory setting and is a powerful force that shapes who we are. But to answer some of these basic questions, I think we just need to get things set up first. In this short video, we're going to talk about the basics of what classical conditioning is. We're going to talk about how classical conditioning works, and then I think maybe more importantly than anything else, we're going to talk about some of the confusing classical conditioning terminology that we all have to deal with when learning about this stuff. Now, no discussion of classical conditioning would be complete without a discussion of this guy right here, Ivan Pavlov. Now, I know that you guys have read about him in your book, you know that he was the first guy to identify classical conditioning in the laboratory, but I think telling this story is a big part of illustrating how conditioning works. One of the things you should know about Ivan Pavlov is that he was not a psychologist. He didn't care about learning, he didn't care about behavior, he didn't care about any of the stuff that we're learning about in this chapter here. What he did care about was saliva. In fact, Ivan Pavlov revolutionized the field of psychology with the stuff that he did in conditioning, but he won a Nobel Prize, not for this work, for his work in saliva. But like you guys can probably guess, if you're going to work with saliva, you're going to need saliva. And again, as I'm sure you can guess, you don't have very good experimental control if you just go around in the streets trying to take saliva out of people's mouths. That's not okay. You don't know where that mouth has been. You don't know what you're getting, right? So you need better experimental control. You need to know where this saliva is coming from. And again, you can probably guess, even in Imperial Russia when Ivan Pavlov was doing his stuff, it was not okay to lock someone in your basement for the sole purpose of collecting their saliva whenever you needed to do your work. So as I'm sure you know, Ivan Pavlov turned to an animal that we all know does a lot of salivating. They do a lot of drooling. And that is dogs. So what Ivan Pavlov did is he put dogs in a harness, a little bit like the one you can see in the cartoon there. He put them in a harness and uh, used a, uh, a brief surgery to connect their salivary glands to a tube called a cannula and then to a collection vial that sat outside their mouths. And what he would do is he would get these dogs to salivate, just like you or me when we talk about food. He would bring them food and they'd salivate to get ready to eat. Now, unlike your dog or mine that you might bring a piece of steak or chicken or something really tasty like a pork chop, to get them to salivate, he took, their, he took his dogs something really, really tasty, dried meat powder. Now, I'm sure your dogs are pickier than his were, but apparently this worked really, really well. They went wild for the, the dried meat powder. He'd bring them the plate with the meat powder. They'd salivate. He'd take the little vial with the saliva in it, and he'd go take it off to his lab where he'd do the stuff that he did with the saliva. Well, day after day, he did this. He'd bring plate of food, he'd collect the saliva, he'd go back to his lab. And what the dogs experienced was food, saliva, Pavlov leaves. Food, saliva, Pavlov leaves. Food, saliva, Pavlov leaves. Over and over and over and over. Food and saliva, food and saliva, food and saliva. Until one day, Ivan Pavlov identified something interesting. He found that the dogs would start to salivate, not when they saw the food, but when they saw him. He didn't even have to bring a plate of food in the laboratory and the dogs would start to salivate. Now you've probably already guessed why this is. After all, your dogs and cats do the same thing. You go into the, uh, you go into the pantry where the food is, you get out the can opener for your cat, and they start to go wild because they've learned something. They learned that two things they didn't know belong together do in fact belong together, and that specifically one of them predicts that the other one is coming. And this is what classical conditioning is all about. Learning that two things you didn't know belong together do in fact belong together. With Ivan Pavlov's dogs, for example, they learned that two things they didn't know belong together, Ivan Pavlov and food, do in fact belong together. And that specifically one of them, Pavlov, predicts that the other, the food, is coming. Now this does a pretty good job of identifying like what classical conditioning is for. 
learning that two things you didn't know belong together do belong together, but it doesn't really explain how classical conditioning works. Now, whether we're talking about classical or operant conditioning, one of the key parts is to identify the terminology, to understand how the terms work. And I know a lot of the terms related to conditioning can be really complex, they can be hard to understand, or at least they seem that way. Many of the terms from this chapter, however, are really two-part terms. They're words made out of two other words. And if you understand what each one of these words is, you got the whole thing. So let's start with the basics and talk about two words that underlie all of conditioning. These words are stimulus and response. Now, again, at first these seem like they might be complex scientific things, but they really, really aren't. A stimulus is simply anything at all that an organism like you or a dog can detect. This can be a light or a sound. It can be a car, a desk, a slice, a pizza, a smell, anything. If you detect it, if it comes from the outside world, it's a stimulus. Now, in contrast, a response is something that you do as a result of experiencing a stimulus. Often in a classical conditioning example, or even an operant conditioning example, if you're trying to figure out what's a stimulus and what's a response, the best thing to do is just ask yourself, is this something I would do, or is this something I would detect? For example, if you're driving, a red light or a green light, a traffic light, would be a stimulus, but stopping at that light would be a response. The feeling of hunger you get in the middle of the day when it's time for lunch, well, that's a stimulus. Actually eating the food is a response. Uh, somebody saying something mean to you is a stimulus. You saying something mean back to them, why, that's a response, but so would turning the other cheek. Now these two terms, again, they form the basis of all of conditioning, stimulus and response, but they don't do a fantastic job of explaining step-by-step step how classical conditioning works, and that's really the goal of what we're doing here today. So what I'd like to do next is explain to you how does classical conditioning work and give you some ideas about how to remember the complex terms like conditioned and unconditioned, stimulus, and response. In order to do this, I'm going to turn to my assistant, my very good friend, somebody with whom I do a lot of classical conditioning, my five-year-old boxer named Ruger. Ruger and I do lots of conditioning together. Uh, we train for competitions. I ask him to be good, just like your dogs, cats, ferrets, rats, cats, even fish, you want them to behave nicely. Well, you do conditioning to make that happen. So I figured, what better way to talk about conditioning than to use Ruger? Now, one of the key elements of doing good conditioning, teaching an animal or a person that two things, two stimuli they didn't know belong together, do in fact belong together, one of the key parts of doing this well is to pick your stimuli well. This job is a lot easier if you pick your stimuli ahead of time and make sure that they're going to work pretty well. So the first thing you need to do is pick your first stimulus well, and the key to that is to pick something that they automatically care about. Now I'm sure there are things that you automatically care about, I care about, that your friends, colleagues, pets automatically care about, but with Ruger, there is one thing he cares about more than anything in the whole wide world, and that is his absolute favorite, turkey hot dogs. Ruger loves turkey hot dogs. He will do anything for a piece of turkey hot dog. He will do backflips for these things. He will do your taxes for these things. He loves them. And I like them because they're a third less fat and low sodium, like you can see in the picture. So they're a really great stimulus to use for Ruger. Now you can probably guess, Ruger, without any training, automatically cares about these things. And that's where this term up at the top of the picture comes from. This turkey hot dog is what we would call an unconditioned stimulus. Now the second part of that term is a really easy thing to understand. It's a stimulus because it's something he detects. But that term unconditioned, well, you guys know the prefix un means not. And conditioning, if you think about conditioning, not like learning in this sense, but conditioning like what athletes do, conditioning is training. And if you think about conditioning that way, we say, well, this is an untrained stimulus. It's a stimulus that Ruger doesn't have to be trained to care about. This hot dog is something that he automatically wants. Now, in being good scientists, we can't just assume that this is the case. We have to prove that this is the case. How do we know that the turkey hot dog is something that Ruger automatically cares about? Now, many of you will say, it's common sense. But we can just figure, what does Ruger do if we give him a piece of turkey hot dog? What does he do, and will that tell us whether or not he automatically cares about it? Well, do you want to see what Ruger does when I give him a piece of turkey hot dog? I'm sure you do. So let's take a look here. What does Ruger do if I show him a piece of turkey hot dog? Well, in this video, I throw him a piece, 
It's not just him. It's him and his sister Hazel on the left and his brother Wyatt on the right. And you can see Ruger misses the hot dog, but Wyatt gets a piece. And we can ask him, Wyatt, what do you think of that turkey hot dog? Pretty good, right? He really likes it. It's pretty good. Now, you can probably tell automatically, did, did we train Wyatt to respond that way when he ate the turkey hot dog? No, it's, it's an automatic response. We know that the unconditioned stimulus, that turkey hot dog, is an unconditioned stimulus because it automatically, without any training, produces a response. And remember, a response is just something you do after experiencing a stimulus. In this case, the specific kind of response that Wyatt gives us is what we would call an unconditioned response. Remember, un means not, condition is training. We didn't have to train Wyatt to do this. So the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response go hand in hand automatically. And this gets to the core of why the unconditioned response is important in the first place. Remember, classical conditioning is all about learning that two stimuli go together, but this unconditioned response is important because it tells us that Wyatt cares or that Ruger cares about that piece of turkey hot dog. The reason that we need this unconditioned response is because Wyatt and Ruger, as brilliant as they are, don't speak very good English. So in order to tell that this turkey hot dog is important, we have to see what they do when they detect it. Now, your dog and mine would love for us to believe that this is learning, but it's not. It's just giving them hot dogs. In order for this to be classical conditioning, we have to have two stimuli and teach them that they go together. So the one thing that we're missing at this point is another stimulus. In picking your second stimulus, you want to get something that we would say is neutral. Something that Wyatt or Ruger or your own dog could detect, but that they don't automatically care about. Something that, I don't know, they don't know anything about. A good example, in this case, for Ruger, my dog, would be a whistle. You can probably guess that Ruger detects whistles just fine. He can hear them just fine, but he doesn't really know anything about them. He doesn't really care what they mean. I've never taught him that they mean anything. So you can imagine, Ruger and I, we go to the park, I sit him down, I tell him to be a good boy, and then I put that whistle in my mouth, I blow the whistle, and I give him a piece of hot dog. Then I blow the whistle, and I give him a piece of hot dog, whistle, hot dog, whistle, hot dog, whistle, hot dog, over and over and over, right? So I keep doing this for a long period of time. I go, whistle, hot dog, whistle, hot dog, whistle, hot dog, not a whole hot dog, just a piece of hot dog, whistle, hot dog, whistle, hot dog, whistle, hot dog, whistle, hot dog, until eventually you can imagine Ruger's going to learn something. He's going to learn that every single time I blow that whistle, he's about to get another piece of hot dog. That is learning. That is conditioning. Classical conditioning is all about learning that two things you didn't know belong together, like a whistle and a hot dog, do in fact go together. And that one of them, the whistle, predicts that the other one, the hot dog, is coming. Now remember, this whistle is something Ruger could detect, but he didn't know anything about it to begin with. He had to be trained to care about it. He had to be trained to know that this whistle went with the hot dog, the thing he cared about. As a result, we would say that this whistle, while it's a stimulus like the hot dog, it is, an, it is a conditioned stimulus. He has to be trained to care about it. Conditioned, trained, stimulus, something he can detect. Now, ultimately, your training at this point is done. The classical conditioning is done. The unconditioned and conditioned stimuli, they've gone together enough that Ruger knows to care about them. But remember, we can't just ask Ruger, what do you think about whistles? Do you know that they go with hot dogs? We just, we can't ask him. So in order to tell whether or not this conditioning has worked, we have to do something special. We have to blow the whistle for Ruger, but not give him the hot dog. We have to give him just the conditioned stimulus. You might ask yourself, why can't I just keep giving him both of these? Well, if I give him both of them together, I'm not really going to be able to tell anything because he's going to get all excited because he sees the hot dog. But if I blow just the whistle for him, well, what do we look for? If I blow just the whistle for Ruger, what I want to see is what we're seeing here, Wyatt getting all excited. We want to see Ruger getting excited, looking for a hot dog, waiting for a hot dog, anticipating a hot dog, wagging his tail, spinning in circles, salivating like Ivan Pavlov's dogs in order to tell me that he knows that that whistle is important. And he knows that that whistle is important because the whistle and the hot dog go together. Again, the conditioned response isn't part of learning. 
This response that he gives us when he gets just the conditioned stimulus on its own, this response that he's been trained to give, this conditioned response to the stimulus alone is not part of the learning, but it's important because it tells us that Ruger has learned something that he knows that the whistle and the hot dog go together. So again, just to recap, classical conditioning is all about learning that two things go together that you didn't know go together. The important parts of classical conditioning have to do with the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, the conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned response. And at first, these terms seem really complicated because of these big, long, two-part terms. But if you understand that unconditioned just means something that isn't trained, that doesn't need to be trained, that conditioned is something that is trained, that does need to be trained, that a stimulus is something you detect, and that a response is something that you do, it makes it a lot easier to break this down. I hope this short video has been helpful. Um, if you want to know more about classical conditioning, feel free to get in contact with me, see me during office hours, shoot me an email, or post something in the discussion topics. And if you want to know more about operant conditioning and how we change behaviors that we want to see more or less of, just move on to the next video. Thanks a lot, guys. I look forward to talking with you if you've got any questions. Otherwise, good luck with the rest of Chapter 5 and Chapter 9 next week.